us to find uh, uh, the uh, charge of an object which contains 11 protons, 12 neutrons, and 10 electrons. We have to recall what are the charges of the uh, particles constituting the uh, um, ion. Protons have charge of one elementary charge, neutrons have charge of uh, zero coulombs, and electrons have uh, charge opposite to protons. So we have 11 times E minus 12 times 0 plus 10 times minus E, which will give us just E, which means that it's elementary charge. Uh, charge of the ion is equal to the elementary charge. All right. Um, now, in order to comprehend the two Gauss's laws, uh, we have to first uh, learn what uh, uh, a flux of a vector is. And uh, <coughs> in a way, it is similar. I mean, the construction is very similar to this of uh, uh, mm, line integral. Uh, we have to calculate the scalar product of a uh, uh, certain vector quantity, which is assi assigned to each point in the space, and a uh, certain vector which is associated this time with a surface element rather than segment element. So, uh, the formal definition is here. For a certain surface S, uh, if for a certain vector S, uh, surface S, a vector function f of r is defined for all points of the surface, this particular integral is called the flux of vector f over or through surface S. It's not off surface S. It is over or through. Well, let's take a look actually how we uh, construct this sum. Now, what, uh, what do you, anybody recalls what we call this sum? A what? Riemann sum, correct. So here we have limit of a Riemann sum, right. So if we have a surface, we have to divide surface in, into tiny pieces. They, those pieces have to be so tiny that they appear to be absolutely flat. Um, now, uh, since, uh, function, f since this vector function is assigned to every point of space, or at least of the surface, it means that it has a certain value uh, at a point of that fragment. It has a certain value. So here, in the Riemann sum, I have to take the value of that function. If I take, obviously, another piece, I would have to take a value of that vector function which is assigned to that other piece, and so on. But let's come back to that first piece. Uh, now I have to multiply by a vector assigned to that piece. And that vector represents uh, the size and the orientation. And it is done uh, of that piece. It is done in a quite similar way like we do it for a, a differential segment. Can, can you recall how we do it for differential segments? How that segment vector is assigned for a differential segment? Anybody is willing to say that? Jerry, how about you? Yeah, that vector ds, how we assign, and we discussed this, we have discussed this recently, precisely yesterday. Yeah, yeah. how we assign vector ds to a fragment of a segment, or to a differential segment. Kai, do you remember that? How? Yeah, that, that how, well, we use it in line integral, correct, but how we assign vector ds? Now let me go to the whiteboard and <coughs> draw it again. Yeah, I will draw the line. Now, try. Yeah. 
we divide line into small pieces and to each of those pieces we assign a segment vector how about if I make it with a different color now we call it segment vector how did we do that yes it doesn't, I'm asking just not over what line. Oh, okay, at least one thing. It is tangent to the line. Right now, if I take it differential, then it will be just a fragment of the line. Uh, so, so its orientation is tangent to the line, indeed, which, which means that it coincides with the direction of the segment. The segment vector is in the direction of the segment, right? This segment is oriented that way, and the segment vector is oriented this way or that way. We still have ambiguity, and uh, it's arbitrary which orientation we choose. One of those two. Line integrals will work one way or the other way. All right, so we took care of the orientation. Now let's take care of the magnitude of that vector how the magnitude of that vector is assigned to this vector. Yes, Christy? Consult with each other. Talk to each other. And I know even why you forgot it, because it was too easy. But you, we have to be aware of it. I know that it was easy when you listen, listen to me, but you also have to remember it. So if somebody asks you, you know it. Do you know? The same as what? So that the magnitude of the segment vector is proportional to the slope. It isn't. It's, it's, it's really complicated, by the way. I mean, it would make sense, but it is not. This is not how we assign the segment vector. So the magnitude of this vector, which actually, what is the geometrical interpretation of the magnitude of, of that arrow? Magnitude of an arrow is what? Length of that arrow, correct. Uh, all right, so now how we assign magnitude of the vector segment? Same, uh, what is the S? Same as the, legment, uh, as the length of that segment, correct. Yes, yeah, so, the, and actually you can see it. Yeah, look, that, that gr uh, red arrow is as long as that blue segment. I made it on a drawing, so the orientation is along the segment and the magnitude is equal to the size of that tiny segment. This is how we did for segments. Uh, now, over here it is a little bit more complicated. Yeah, because now, why don't you, why don't you grab uh, uh, your uh, notebook and put put it somehow in space and, and tell your neighbor what is the orientation of that notebook. Yeah, do it. Go ahead. Grab the notebook, put it simultaneously, and, now, and then figure out how to tell your neighbor what's the orientation of it. In other words, show the direction of the, because orientation is a directional quantity. So what is the direction of it? And uh, you will still have ambiguity. There will be two possibilities. But it's not that that's orientation, for example. If I, <laughs> for this surface, don't tell me that this is the orientation. You have to show the direction. Like, and when we show the direction, we should be able to point our hand in that direction, like this way, or this way, or this way, or this way. Yeah, so what is the orientation of this flat surface? Find and actually, it's a, 
It's a convention. We developed it because it's the simplest way to describe orientation. It was, it was similar, for example, to this how we describe the orientation of, if, uh, of a rotation. Yeah, if I'm spinning, yeah, my angular velocity is, has also direction, but obviously it's not like that. Right? What was the direction of my velocity, by the way? Which way? Not counterclockwise, because it depends who is looking at me. Yeah, from the top, I will look counterclockwise. From the bottom, I will look clockwise. So clockwise, counterclockwise is good only for a plane, not in three-dimensional space. Yes, uh, Vincent. Uh, I was ah, correct. We made it. We are doing it in, in not as intuitive way as we assign the direction of the segment vector, but it is still the simplest way. All right. Uh, now, anybody came with an idea how to how to describe orientation, or maybe no, somebody knows it. If not. I'll, I'll let you know, and, and you think, well, it makes sense. Yeah, let's use the normal, the direction normal to the surface, right? So, this way. Here is the direction of the, uh, of that surface. This is the orientation of the segment. That normal vector, rather than vector parallel to the surface, describes orientation. Yeah, because we have too many parallel to the surface. All right. Uh, so indeed, this vector dA, or this vector delta, delta A over here, and this dA over there, they, uh, they are normal to the differential fragment of the surface. Now, magnitude is supposed to say about uh, how big is that <laughs> Uh, that uh, tiny surface so magnitude of this vector is equal to the area similarly to this like it was length over there and I want you to remember so when I ask you tomorrow how we assign the segment vector differential segment uh, sorry uh, yeah differential surface uh, vector this is differential segment vector this is differential uh, surface uh, uh, vector. So for, for a line we have differential segment vectors, for surfaces we have differential surface vectors. All right, so now you have to imagine that for each fragment of the surface we have to calculate scalar product between the vector function uh, at the location of the segment multiplied by that uh, normal uh, differential surface uh, vector. Now we are uh, uh, in position to comprehend Gauss's law. Uh, it says that the net flux, flux, the net electric flux through any closed surface now, I haven't discussed what is a closed surface. Closed surface is such that you cannot get uh, from one side of the surface to the other side of the sur surface without crossing the surface. So, for example, if I take a, a sheet of paper, is it a closed surface, also referred to as Gaussian surface? Is it a closed surface? Can I, in other words, can I imagine a path connecting points on two sides of the surface which do not cross, uh, which doesn't cross the surface. Yeah, now let's find first the two points. Mike, can you point two points on two sides of the surface? One and two. All right, now can you imagine a path, in other words, a line, which connects those two points and doesn't cross the surface? Who can imagine it? One, two, Three. Okay, Christy, so where is that surface? Uh, where is that line? Just, uh, For example, along Mike's hands, right? Uh, put, it, put it back. Yeah, I can imagine, I can imagine a line like this, right? That line does not cross the surface. 
Now, can you imagine a surface in which it is impossible? Talk to each other. Find a surface in which it... Oh, how about if I try it that way? Maybe this one is closed. Now, which two points... Mike, can you put points on two sides of the surface? Like that, right. Can we imagine a line which will connect those two points and not cross the surface? Can you, Mike? It's still the same, right? Which means that this surface is still open. It isn't closed surface. Talk to each other and find out the shape of a surface which is closed. Uh, you had an idea? Shout. A sphere, for example. A complete sphere. Uh, if you imagine a point inside of the sphere and outside of the sphere, you are unable to draw a line which will connect those two points and will not cross that sphere. Correct. All right, so you understand what a Gaussian surface is. <coughs> and <coughs> Gauss's law says that this uh, elect uh, electric flux through a closed surface is proportional to the net charge inside of that surface. So for example, if I take a sphere uh, and try to figure out what, will be, what should be the net flux through that uh, sphere, I would have to see what is the value of the charge of all particles inside the sphere, no matter where they are. All right, so let's say that I have two charged particles. Uh, I represented now the field using what? These lines are referred to as <coughs> electric field lines, right? So for example, at this point, the direction of electric field would be in which direction? To the left, right? Electric field lines represent that, it, the, that it's to the left. And now I will find, uh, pick a Gaussian surface. So it's a, an ellipsoid. Uh, and those two particles are inside. Now, if I calculate flux uh, through that surface outward, uh, which means that I'm considering uh, the uh, uh, surface uh, vectors to be outward, not inward. Do you, can you imagine me? All that nor those normal surface, uh, surface uh, vectors are outward. Uh, why don't you talk to each other and try to estimate if this flux is positive or negative, talk, or zero. Talk to each other. Just from the definition of flux. Now brainstorm. I, I don't hear that brainstorm yet. All right, so let's vote. Who thinks that the flux, that this flux is going to be positive? Uh, who thinks that this flux is going to be negative? Who thinks that this flux is going to be zero? Who doesn't think? Still too many people. <laughs> All right, now, uh, it is outward. So how about if we, uh, uh, if we ask somebody who believes that uh, for justification? Uh, uh, and uh, who is volunteering to justify that? I'll help it. I have very many ideas. Uh-huh. Okay, go ahead. I noticed that all the, all the directions were pointed outwards, and that's why I decided to use positive. And you were right. Yeah, you were right. Yeah, because we have to calculate here scalar products. So now imagine, well, all, uh, now which all vectors? 
the surface vectors or the electric field vectors? Or surface. Are the electric field vectors tangent to those lines? Right. Uh huh. Yeah. So they are. They electric. It means that at the surface, uh, at each point of the surface, electric field was pointing outward. But actually, this is insufficient argu argument for the positive value of the flat. And I, I'm glad that I heard also the other argument. Uh, well, the necessary condition that the surface vectors were also outward. So, uh, electric field vectors were outward and uh, surface vectors were outward for all segments of that surface. If I divide the surface into, into those pieces, I can recognize that at each piece, the angle between electric field vector and the surface vector is less than 90 degrees. They are maybe at an angle, but they are facing both outward. All right, now we have to calculate scalar product of those two. And, uh, and indeed, scalar product of those two is going to be positive for any segment. Now, uh, justify that it is going to be positive. I don't believe it. Well, we have to recall how we calculate scalar product. It, well, it's multiplication, yeah, but so what? Why is it that we got only positive numbers? We didn't multiply two positive values. What did we multiply? We multiplied two vectors. Vectors are not positive or negative. Is I positive or negative? And how, is it, how does it compare to J and K? Yeah, vectors, numbers are positive. Think about it, what does it mean positive? Positive means greater than zero. Vectors don't have relation which one is greater, which one is uh, smaller. Uh, their magnitudes, however, do. And now let's recall a way of calculating scalar product because we have we have two convenient ways of calculating scalar product. And one of those works really well now. Yeah, so consult with each other how we calculate scalar product. Depending on this, what we know about. If we know magnitudes of a vector and the angle between them, how we calculate it in this situation, and how we calculate a scalar product if we know uh, scalar components in the Cartesian coordinate system of both vectors. Consult with each other. Rec recall how we do that. <coughs> All right, help me then. Guys, help me. So, how we calculate? Yes. You, you. <laughs> well, we forgot how to multiply, guys. Yeah, when we calculate scalar product, we can do it by take, taking a product of magnitude of the first vector times magnitude of the second vector times cosine of the angle between them and now magnitude of a vector is never negative and so if I take two vectors which let's say have uh, form an angle less than 90 degrees magnitude of the first vector is not negative and actually I can even see that over there but well, they are positive magnitude of the second vector is positive cosine of an angle between 0 and 90 degrees is positive. So we multiply three positive numbers, we get a positive value for scalar product of the uh, electric field vector and the surface vector, the differential surface vector, for every segment. If we add positive numbers, we will get a positive answer.
Now the second way is, is just a digression, but the second way of calculating scalar product, if we know scalar components of uh, those two vectors in a Cartesian coordinate system, we multiply first component by first component, second component by second component, third component by third component, and add the products. This will also yield the scalar product of the two vectors. Refresh your memory now how to multiply. We should know how to multiply in this class. Now it's not trivial because we know four products. So recall how to multiply using all four products. And three of those products involve multiplications of vectors. Uh, all right, so if we look at, at the uh, uh, at this picture, we see that it is going to be positive. Yes? Sorry, um, take a step back because oh. you know, that won't make sense for me. The, uh, how do you know that the surface vectors um, and the electric field vectors are both pointing out? Like I see in the picture, what are the arrows in the picture referring to? The electric field vectors? No, um, they refer to electric field lines. You know, so these are the lines. Now, well, I mean, so probably you have, uh, you don't visualize it properly because, I mean, let's, so, so let's try to visualize it. So let's say, could you make two particles from your hands, right? So let's say that this is one particle, this is another particle. The surface, oh, and let, so let's start with the lines, uh, electric field lines. Electric field lines are like that. Uh, heading outward, right? So if I choose this point, electric field, is in this direction. If I choose this point, electric field is in this direction. If I choose this point, electric field is in this direction. Consistently with that picture. Now that Gaussian surface which we picked is, is, is an ellipsoid containing both particles. So you have to imagine an ellipsoid like that. You see this? And I ask you to calculate flux outward, which means that I'm for, for the fragments of the surface, I take normal vectors outward. So for example, let's say, let's say that I consider this surface over here. Vector outward is in this direction, and we saw that the electric field is also in this direction. Is it clear for everybody? Yeah. That's great. Thanks. Uh, that proportionality constant uh, between the flux, flux of the electric field vector and the charge inside of that Gaussian surface is referred to as permittivity of free space. So here is permittivity of free space. Um, now looking at that picture, uh, the net charge inside of that Gaussian surface is positive, negative or zero on the basis how we evaluated the uh, flux through the Gaussian surface. So who believes that the charge inside is positive? <coughs> who believes that it is negative? Who believes that it's zero? Uh, we have to have a discussion. Consult with your neighbor if the charge inside of the surface is positive, negative, or zero based on the flux. Now, uh, one thing, uh, perm uh, permittivity of, of free space is a positive number. It's a physical constant. It is a positive number. It has a particular value. And the, you, can, you have this value on the cover of your book. Ian, what's your opinion? Uh, how about Madumida, how about you? Let's start with this. What, how, uh, when we evaluated uh, the flux, we came to the conclusion that it's positive, negative, or zero. Shout. Positive. Correct. Yes, so on the left hand side, we have a positive number. 
Vincent, what's the chart? Positive, negative, or zero? How did you figure it out? Factor, right. Yeah, because abs I mean, permittivity of free space is a positive number. The flux which we evaluated is positive. <coughs> then charge inside must be positive. Now, uh, actually from the drawing you can see another argument for it. Look for it. L uh, identify that argument, please. Correct, the way I draw the lines. These lines indicate that both particles uh, have a positive charge. All right. Now, uh, um, I think when, uh, when the uh, interaction, electrostatic interaction was described by Coulomb, he didn't really start from Gauss's law. And uh, it's a kind of invention of the following scientists, I mean, f scientists who were born later. And uh, it is simply more elegant uh, theory when we assume that Gauss's law for, electrostat for electric field vector is an axiom rather than force between two charged particles. Um, so we reverse, it is historically, Gauss's law was not uh, found before Coulomb's law. All right, now if we believe that Gauss's, and, and actually right now I'll show you why having Gauss's law is such a, uh, well, good thing to have in advance. And we will also see what happens if uh, Gauss's law is not applicable. Um, if we, I mean, so let's now try to find out what kind of electric field is produced by a charged particle. And uh, we will see that if we have systems uh, which have high symmetry, Gauss's law is very uh, good, to de uh, uh, very convenient to derive expressions for electric field. We can quickly predict what is electric field produced by those objects, provided that the objects have appropriate symmetry. Particle has a very nice symmetry, because it has spherical symmetry. Um, so, from Gauss's law, and I, I will pick up a convenient surface. I will uh, uh, pick a spherical surface concentric with the, with the particle. From the symmetry, I can conclude that the electric field vector must be radial. Uh, yeah, because, for example, if I consider this point, and imagine that I flip everything, or, or rotate about an axis passing through the point and through the particle, how the picture would change? Not at all. Correct. The picture should not change at all. Well, it means that the electric field must be along that line because otherwise, if it were at an angle and I rotated it along the axis, let's say by 180 degrees, a vector like that in this direction would flip to a vector in this direction. But it shouldn't. The only way that it doesn't, it means it, it is that it has to be perpendicular or along that axis of rotation. And, I, and for each point over there, I can do that. Now, how about if I compare electric field at that point with electric field with this point? Oh, um, yeah, this electric field at this point with electric field at this point on the surface. And in order to, to make a comparison, I'll think about what will happen if I rotate this sphere counterclockwise by 90 degrees. So this point will move to that point. So uh, what will be my conclusion about the two electric fields at this location with electric fields at this location? They what? 
are either going straight in or straight out. You rotate and probably doing the same thing, just the spots and symmetry. Well, so let's start with the symmetry. If I rotate it, should I see a difference? I should, right? Now, electric field at that point is radial, so it's in this direction. Electric field at this point is radial, it's in this direction. Well, but so, so the, I see that when I rotate this point to that point, the directions will agree, right? But it still doesn't mean that I don't see a difference. Something else has to be identical in order for me not to see the difference. What? The magnitude, correct. So I can recognize that magnitude of electric field everywhere on this concentric surface has the same value. Electric field at each point is, so just looking at the symmetry, I conclude that electric field is perpendicular to that sphere everywhere at, at every point. Or I should say that at every point electric field is perpendicular to the surface. And everywhere on that surface, the value, the value of the magnitude is the same. All right. So, let, uh, let now evaluate the flux uh, uh, to the, through that surface. And we know that this flux has to be proportional to the charge inside of that <laughs> surface. Now, I, I'm, I'm considering only single particle so that net charge inside of that surface is equal to the charge of this particle. So here I have that the electric flux through that sphere is equal to the charge inside of the sphere at the center of the sphere divided by uh, permittivity of free space. And from the definition of flux, I, I know that I have to calculate that uh, integral of that scalar product. And now I relate it to the Magnet to, to the magnitudes of electric fields. Now, so I take magnitude of the first vector, so it's electric field strength. In, in, uh, uh, we refer it to the magnitude of electric field as electric field strength. Now, magnitude of this vector is equal to what? Recall how the segment ve uh, so, uh, surface vector was uh, introduced. It was perpendicular to the surface and its magnitude was equal to the area of that surface. Which surface? That differential surface, right. So that differential surface. And now I have to multiply by cosine of the angle between the uh, vector dA, which is normal to the surface, and vector E, which is perpendicular to that surface. They both heading up outward. So what's the angle between them? Zero. So I have cosine of zero. Now in this integral, I mean I don't even uh, need to use fundamental ca uh, theorem of calculus because before I do this, I can recognize that uh, electric field strength is a constant in this integral. Mathematically, it's a constant. It has the same value for each piece. So I can pull it out in front of the integral. Yeah, because which law I'm using? Why we can do it? Because multiplication is distributive over addition for numbers. Yeah, think about this S refers to the sum. Now cosine of zero is one. It's also constant. I can pull it out. So I will be left with electric field strength multiplied by the sum of differential areas of all pieces constituting the surface. What am I going to get if I add all those areas? The area. Wh what area? Of what? Yeah. Area of that, the, en <coughs> the, en the area of the entire surface. Now, do we know the, uh, uh, how to find the area of that entire surface? I mean, let's say that I, if I knew the radius of that sphere. Yes, right? How much it is going to be? Area of a sphere. How is it related to the radius? Not this is volume. Not two thirds. Four pi r squared. All right. So four pi r squared. Yes, yeah, so four, 
4 pi r squared gives me the area of this entire surface. Here I have electric field strength at the surface, at any point at the surface. On this side I have charge inside the surface and permittivity of free space. I already recognize that electric field is going to be perpendicular to the, to the surface. So from this expression I can find out that electric field strength is charge inside divided by permittivity of free space and divided by 4 pi r squared over here. Well, I can take this 4 pi and epsilon 0. They are set and constant and I have inverse of that. I will call this entire inverse as a, as a constant and in fact it has a name of Coulomb's, Coulomb constant of the Coulomb constant and uh, what will be left I will have charge uh, yes I have Coulomb con constant times charge in principle I consistently with the drawing I should have capital Q here uh, divided by what is remaining is this uh, square of the radius and here I indicate that it is in the direction of uh, radial direction yet this unit vector is a unit vector directed from the charge, from, which is the source of the, uh, of the field. Well, now let's combine what we just found with the definition of uh, electric field vector. Now let's say that I have two, par two particles. Now let, I have one particle, and this particle uh, produces electric field somewhere over there. The electric field at that location from that expression which we just derived is equal to Coulomb's constant times charge of the particle producing the field divided by the distance from the particle to that uh, point of interest and uh, the direction is radial from the particle. Now, if I place a second particle over there, how to find force exerted on that second par particle by the first particle? What do I have to do? Multiply the electric field produced by the source by the charge of the second particle, which means that I have to include charge over here and that way I'm going to get the force. So Coulomb, this is what Coulomb's law says that the force exerted on particle 2 by particle 1 is equal to Coulomb constant multiplied by the, char by the charges of the two particles divided by square of the distance and the direction is along the line connecting those two particles. So, if I look at this expression and I have two, but that both particles are positive, how they are going to interact? Yeah, so think that this, these two particles are, have positive charge, which way, what will be the direction of the force exerted on particle two? Which way? along vector E1, correct. The force is going to be this way. Now, uh, we saw during the experiment uh, uh, um, on the first day that there is a possibility that, that uh, charged particles attract each other. When does it happen? Right. At, if one of those charges is positive, and one is negative, then the force will be opposite to that vector, which means that the force will be toward particle one. Force exerted on particle two, on particle one, will be toward. Now, if I use the same consideration and try now to figure out what force is exerted by particle two on particle one, how would I do that? Well, since it is the, the, the time is almost over, I'll, I, I'll tell you. Yes, I, I will now consider electric fields at that location produced by particle 2. It will be Coulomb's constant, charge of particle 2, 
divided by square of the distance from this point to this point and the unit vector now would be heading the other direction then when I I imagine that what would happen if I place particle 1 at that location so I have to multiply by charge of particle 1 so if I flip the indices over here I have to flip indices over here the unit vector will be in the opposite direction all right so this is all for today thank you very much and see you tomorrow <laughs>